Oh, I didn't see you there. All right, guys. So this is our last bit of notes. Uh, like I said in the, in the previous video, this is our last bit of notes for this unit. This will be the last video of this set of notes uh, for the unit. So we're going to end by continuing talking about counterculture um, in the 1960s and 70s. So for many in the counterculture, living in normal society was unacceptable. They did not want to live a normal life in any respect. It wasn't enough for them to dress extravagantly in different ways than their parents uh, or different ways than the powers that be. They wanted to live an entirely different lifestyle. And the Haight Ashbury district of San Francisco, uh, named for the corner of Haight Street and Ashbury Street, was the epicenter of that counterculture. Um, this is a, uh, uh, a note from Alex Foreman, a personal voice quoted from Camelot to Kent State. It says it was like paradise there. Everybody was in love with life and in love with their fellow human beings to the point where they were just sharing incredible ways with everybody, uh, taking, people in off, taking people in off the street and letting them stay in their homes. You could walk down almost any street in Haight-Ashbury where I was living and someone would smile at you and, and just go, hey, it's beautiful, isn't it? It was a very special time. And with that quote, you can kind of get an idea of how people lived. It was just generally pleasant to live in that area at the time because people were living, experiencing the counterculture uh, and trying to live it in the best of their ability. For many in the counterculture, I <laughs> every single time. Uh, anyway, so living blah, 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 normal society was unacceptable. Some hippies created self-sustaining communes where property was shared um, and where people lived together in what was effectively a mass family. Um, Drop City, Colorado uh, was one of these communes, which later moved to New Mexico. Um, these are members of the Hog Farm Commune in California. Um, you know, this is kind of a famous picture of, of theirs with this psychedelic bus and the people all stacked in it and on it. Um, this is uh, further of the uh, Hog Farm Commune. Just people living together in a collective uh, area where nobody owns one thing, but everybody owns everything together. Um, it's sort of a very, uh, people compare it to communism, commune, communism, and it is relatively similar. It's just on a much smaller, more intimate scale. So let's zoom out a little bit. Conclusions about America in the 1960s. Both the New Left protest and hippie counterculture were visible in the 1960s, but neither of those represented the majority of Americans. Now, there was a conservative uh, group of Americans that were referred to as the silent majority by people like Richard Nixon. Conservative citizens were a silent majority that believed that the youth movement was destroying traditional American values. Um, when I said they were a silent majority, you guys would know what I meant if I said that the loudest people get the most attention, right? Well, this is sort of an example of that. The hippie movement, the new left, the counterculture, all that stuff, those were some of the loudest people uh, both, you know, metaphorically and physically. Um, and uh, as a result, they got a lot of attention because of how they acted, because of how they dressed, because of what the counterculture represented in the 1960s and 70s. But Nixon, people like Nixon, said that there was a majority of Americans who didn't really want to bother with all that, didn't really care about all that, and he referred to them as the silent majority. And the silent majority believed that the youth movement, like the New Left and the counterculture, was destroying traditional American values. Con conservatives, like Nixon, changed U.S. politics um, by voting for Nixon in 1968. Um, the success of the civil rights movement, though, and anti-Vietnam protest by the New Left inspired other groups to demand change as well. Movements like the Black Power Movement, movements like the Red Power Movement, the American Indian Movement, the Brown Power Movement and Chicano Movement with Cesar Chavez, the Pink Power Movement with women's rights, women's equality, the ERA, and Betty Friedan, the Yellow Power Movement as well with Asian Americans and the uh, Asian American Coalition, the Green Power Movement, which encompassed everyone because everyone lives on Earth, and then, of course, the Rainbow Power Movement uh, and the GLF, the Gay Liberation Front. All of these groups are going to be inspired by the successes of the civil rights movement, the anti-Vietnam protests, the attitudes of the new left, and just the general way people felt about the time in which they lived in the 1960s, late 1960s, early 70s. So uh, 
here is our closure activity. Again, we don't have a classroom in which to do this activity. So I'm going to leave it to you guys to go onto YouTube after you watch this video on YouTube. You're already here. You're already on YouTube. Cool. So just go up here in the search bar and type in Bob Dylan blowing in the wind. I want you to listen to it, read the lyrics. If you can find a, a video with the lyrics on it or just search for the lyrics, whatever. What is the message of this song? Which lines of this song are the most powerful to you? And what role do you think music played in the new left and counterculture movements? So take a look at those things um, and, you know, kind of just listen to some stuff. So uh, here's where, you know, one of the main differences in our experience now, because everything's virtual, that has to be a little bit different than otherwise uh, it would be in the classroom. Um, I don't have a lot of music that I can just play for you, you know, here. I'm going to do, but I'm not going to. Um, instead, take a pen or, you know, pause this video, type it out, whatever. There are a few bands that I think you should check out to get a kind of a sense of these, um, uh, of the attitudes of the counterculture movements. Um, check out the Jimi Hendrix experience. Um, you know, songs like Purple Haze and Foxy Lady, and of course his rendition of the Star Spangled Banner are huge. Um, anything by the Mama and the Papas, California Dreamin' is really, really good. Uh, Janis Joplin, again, anything out of Janis Joplin was really good. Bob Dylan, of course, is going to be uh, hugely important in this movement. Him and folk singers like Simon and Garfunkel um, and Arlo Guthrie uh, are, are huge. Um, gosh, I, there, there are literally too many to mention. Uh, Jefferson Airplane. Um, uh, I mean, there's just a bunch. Just go go through, you know, kind of go back and, and you can look at the Woodstock uh, poster from the previous video. You can kind of just scroll down and, and look through some of those Um artists, YouTube, some of those, and just, you know, turn on, tune in and drop out. Don't actually do that. Don't do acid kids. That, don't, don't do LSD. It's not a, not a good time. Not a good plan. Um, at any rate, this is the last video. Like I said at the beginning, this is the last video for this uh, unit. So if you've got any questions, y'all know the drill, remind, email, whatever. Um, and then I will uh, hopefully see you soon. Don't hold your breath though. And most importantly, wash your dang hands. 20 seconds. Bye.